First John <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 15. <clears throat> John writes, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. <clears throat> For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, I spoke to us out of these three verses our last time together. I want to use these three verses as read tonight to speak to us once again out of these passages of Scripture. Lord, I thank you for your Word. I thank you for the leadership of your Word. I thank you for the power of your Word. I pray you'll help us to make uh, tonight to make the application in all of our lives. We realize that we have to fight the world and the flesh and the devil. They are three of our greatest enemies. And help us to learn again from your word how to be overcomers in an overcoming world. I pray you'll speak to our hearts tonight in a special way and make your word known to us in a powerful way. And we'll thank you for it because we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. I think it's important tonight that I take a couple of minutes and just do a review of some things I said in our last Bible study. We hear a lot said about the world when we read the scriptures. And there are three definitions set forth in the Bible. Three definitions of the world. Let me drop them in your heart as I did our last Bible study so that we'll understand where we're coming from tonight in these passages of Scripture. One of the words used for world in the Bible is the word which means the created world. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse number 24, God that made the world and things therein, seeing that he's Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. <clears throat> it's not new news tonight to you folks that God created the world. <clears throat> There's a lot of folks, they don't understand that yet. But the Bible's clear that all things was made by him, the Lord Jesus. And without him was not anything made which was made. So when we speak of the world, first of all, we're talking about the created world. And there are places in the Bible where we put the created world in its proper setting. This doesn't happen to be that setting tonight. The second word for world in the Bible is the world of humanity, the world of people. John chapter 3, verse number 16, for God so loved the world, that's the world of people, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So there's the created world, then there's the world of people. And then thirdly, there's what we call, and the Bible sets forth in our text verses this evening, the world system. I'm going to say it again, the world system. Now you have it here in these three verses of Scripture. He tells us in verse 15 that we're not to love the world. That's not the created world. That's not the world of people. That's the world system. In verse 16, he identifies, and we'll look at this in just a minute, things in the world 
that's bidding for your attention this evening. And in verse number 17, this world system and this world creation is in the process of passing away. Now, the world system that he is depicting in these three verses of Scripture is diametrically opposed to God. Amen. You can say of this world, it's the difference between daylight and darkness. It's the difference in worshiping our living God and bowing down before the God of Baal. It's the difference between worshiping a real God and a false God. The world system is against God. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 19, the Bible says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness, in the lap of the wicked one. And the world system is opposed to Christ and to Christianity. The world tonight, if you're saved, is against you. The world tonight is opposed to you. And the world tonight wants to conform you. It wants to put you in a mold. It wants to put you in the image of this world. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 16, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. In chapter 3, verse number 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. If you're saved tonight, you're known in heaven. But this world don't really know who you are. They don't know what makes you function the way you function. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the world does not know us. They don't understand us, but we know them and we understand them. Amen. We know why the world acts the way it acts, functions the way it functions, because it is a world without God. Now we'll start tonight in our study this evening and say, first of all, there are consequences to this, uh, consequences to loving this world system. Consequences to loving this world system. What are the consequences if we get caught up in the world system? The consequences, <clears throat> simply this, that getting caught up in this world system destroys our fellowship with the Lord. Now I'll say it again. Getting caught up in this world system destroys our fellowship with the Lord. Do you remember the story in Matthew chapter 13? When the Lord gave that great parabolic illustration of the man that went out and sowed the seed, the seed represented the Word of God. And he said as he went out and as he sowed the seed, some of the seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came immediately and they ate the seed. Some of the seed, he said, fell among thorns. And the thorns choked it out. Uh, he said that some of the seed fell on good ground and it brought forth a hundredfold. 60 fold and 30 fold. Now, the Lord, in his interpretation of that parable, told us how the world influences the people of the Word. Listen to what Jesus said. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the Word, hear, watch this phrase, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word 
and it becometh unfruitful. The purpose, my friend, of this world is to dampen your love for spiritual things. I'll be honest with you. I've been at this thing now 40 plus years. The one thing that I would have to say that's stopped more Christians, slowed them down, got them out of church, got them away from spiritual things, is they have gotten bogged down in this world system. The world is no friend of grace. And the world tonight, the allurements of the world, happens to be under the control of the prince of the power of the air. You can find that in Ephesians chapter number 2. The Bible is very clear that the devil is in charge and control of this world system. And if he can't keep you lost, he will do all in his power to get you so infiltrated with this world that you begin to live like you're lost and you conform to the image of this world. We're to be transformed, not conformed, but transformed. Uh, we're sitting in a building tonight and Chris is sitting over here. Where is Chris? Right back here. And Brother Barney Castle back there. And we've got some others in here that dare to mess with electricity. We're sitting in here tonight enjoying the illumination of the sunlight and the illumination of these lights. But let me tell you, there's enough power available on this property to set this building on fire and to burn every building on this property to the ground. We have on this property what's called transformers. It transforms the power. Up here in this field, there's a power line that comes from Union Cross Road. The air conditioning units for this building were so large that the power from 109 was not sufficient to run these units. It needed what's called three-phase power. Three-phase power is not down here on this road. So they had to go up to Union Cross and bring three-phase power down here so we could sit in this building tonight and enjoy the air conditioning. I'm glad we got it down here. <laughs> on that building over there, we got a different phase. But there's transformers on these poles out here. And if it wasn't for them transformers and the wires from this building was hooked into those uh, lines and bypassed those transformers, it would blow every bulb in this building out of the socket and probably set the building on fire. The transformer out there is a powerful object. And the Bible says that we're to be transformed. I mean, the power of heaven that is available to the Christian needs to be infused into the life of the believer. And it's not that we need to see how close we can walk to the world. It is we need to try to figure out how much closer we can walk to the Lord. Because the closer we walk to Him, with Him, the less influence this world will have upon our lives. I remember reading the story years ago of a king that was looking for somebody to drive his chariot. And they raised the question to prospective chariot drivers. He said, if I'm going down this mountain road and there's a huge cliff over here, how close are you going to drive my chariot to that cliff? And one of the prospective drivers said, I can drive you uh, so close, uh, so close to that, uh, uh, that drop-off that just the space of your wheel from the side to that drop-off and still drive you safely. He said, adios. Don't need you. Second driver showed up. Uh, how, how would you drive me with this huge cliff, this drop-off? How would you drive me? I mean, where would you drive me on the road? He said, I could drive you as close as the width of the chariot and still protect you from falling off that cliff. He said, adios. I don't need you either. 
finally, a man stepped forward and the king said, going down this road here where this, where this drop-off is found, how close would you drive me to this, this cliff? He said, King, I would get as far on the other side of the road as I could possibly get to make sure that you safely travel down this road. He said, Son, you've got the job. That ought to be the attitude of every Christian. Not how we can straddle the fence. Not how we can say, Good Lord, good devil but how we can say good Lord and rebuke the devil by staying as close to the Lord as we can and as far away from the world as we should. The Bible is clear on that. Uh, the Bible has taught us in these passages of Scripture that if we love this world system, that the love of the Father is not in us. The Bible is clear that we can't love two masters. We'll either love the one and hate the other or cling to the one, despise the other. But Jesus said we cannot love God and mammon. We cannot have two masters in our lives. And that's what he's trying to get us uh, to understand in these passages of Scripture. Listen to what James said about the world and the Christian. James chapter 4 in verse number 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's what the Bible says. Now, Brother Bede is just sharing that with us tonight. Whosoever will be a friend of this world system is the enemy of God. Now, I learned a long time ago that when you preach on worldliness and the life of the believer, nobody gets up and shouts you down. I learned a long time ago that people had rather preacher just preach about heaven and preacher just preach about how good we are and how humble we are, how loving we are. But Lord, uh, but preacher, don't go meddling. Well, I was ordained to meddle. <laughs> and the Bible's clear. That getting too close to the world is toxic to the Christian. It's like mixing water with gasoline. You fill your tank three quarters full of gas and put the rest of it in water. You're going to go a little ways. But you just wait until the water hits the engine. You're going to be sitting by the side of the highway uh, waiting for somebody to come and rescue you because... Hear me well, the element that does not belong nullifies the usefulness of the element that does belong. Amen. Now, that's just a fact. You can't mix the two. And you cannot mix spirituality in this world. Now, wait a minute. We're in the world, but the Bible says we're not of the world. We have to live in the world. We have to work in the world. We, we live in the world. And we work and we live around lost people. But what the Bible is trying to get us to understand, there was a time when we fellowshiped with and lived like the lost people live. But now that we're saved and we have a new nature imparted unto us and the Spirit of God living within us, we've changed our, our, we have changed our citizenship from this world to heaven. And while we're living in this world as pilgrims and strangers, we're not to be conformed to those around us. We're to so live where they don't impact us now, but rather we impact them for the cause of Christ. I was talking to Shelton Smith last week. He called me. He asked me to come and uh, eat supper with all of the speakers at the Sword Conference. I haven't had an opportunity to do so yet. I've been sick this week, but he asked me to come. And in the course of the conversation, he got to talking to me about uh, a woman preacher somewhere uh, in, in America who got front page coverage in some religious magazine. And the front page coverage she got was because she made this statement, and this is where liberalism takes you today. This is where worldliness takes you today. Uh, she said that, that we cannot any longer in the day in which we live 
take the Bible literally. She said that customs and, and traditions today are different. Customs and traditions are changed. Therefore, we can no longer take the Bible literally. I said to Brother Smith, let me tell you what her problem is. Her problem is she doesn't believe in inspiration. Because when you believe in biblical inspiration, then you understand that God wrote one book for all times. It's called the Bible. And God knew the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And he wrote a book that will apply to all ages. It applied to the ages of the apostles. It applied to the Middle Ages. It applies uh, uh, to the world in which we live today. There are no contradictions in this Bible. And, then, and God knew back then when he had John to write this book that there's one thing that will destroy the usefulness and the effectiveness of a Christian and that is conformity to this world. And my friend, that's where the churches are going. This world today, our country is filled with churches that have lowered their flags uh, and they are moving toward this world system. What, how tragic that is. Uh, the, the church is becoming more and more like the world and pastors, and uh, I don't call them pastors, I call them pastorettes. Uh, they are becoming more and more like the world and less and less like the Lord Jesus Christ. And this world is literally sapping the spiritual vigor out of many people who are, have professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember years ago when we uh, was worshiping in our storefront building. We had a man and his wife who started, to, uh, started attending our services. A uh, young couple. And uh, I thought a lot of them. I don't know, they probably attended our church for a year. And they were faithful. They would come on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival time. They even came out on visitation. We have special events. And probably after about a year, I noticed uh, they started missing now and then. And uh, I kind of got curious and uh, so I picked the phone up one day and I called him. I said, I've been missing you. Yeah, we've, uh, we've decided to uh, put a pool in at our house. And, and we're working now on a Sunday night and Wednesday night trying to get our pool fixed. I said, uh, and I said it lovingly. I said, the, the church ought to be more important to you at church time. And I wanted to say than putting a dumb pool in your yard. And, but I was nice. And I said, if you're not careful, staying out is going to become a habit because if you start moving towards the world, it grows on you and spiritual things begin to come, become dim in your life. And the priority now is not spiritual things. The priority is how we can arrange our schedule to become more worldly. The next thing, about uh, two or three months later, they're completely out of church. They're sitting at home by the pool. My friend, let me tell you something. The devil has more experience than you and I. He knows how to function. He knows how to approach us. He knows what to put in our pathway. And let me tell you something. What seems to be innocent, before you realize it, if you yield a little to him, you give him a foot, he'll take a yard. You give him a mile, he'll take two miles, and he'll, and, and let me tell you how the devil operates. He will get you to doing that which is good, but not that which is best. That's the way the devil operates. He'll get you caught up in things, well, they're not, that's, 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 that's pretty good stuff right there. But the, the, but the best for the Christian is to do what the Bible asks them to do. I want to say this, and I, I'm not saying this against anybody that I can think of other than I'm just saying it because of practicality. I've watched through the years how the devil works in the lives of people that lose loved ones. I've heard this times untold in our church. I've had two people to say, say this just recently, two people. 
And when I say recently, I say within the last year. Uh, they said it here in our church, and their loved one dies. And then I notice uh, they don't show up. And I had a long conversation with one of them, and here's what that person said to me. I just can't hardly stand to come there because every time I attend, all I can see is my loved one in the casket there in front of the pulpit. <laughs> I said, well, let me ask you something. Have you moved out of the house you lived in? I said, you live day and night in the house with your loved one. I said, are you going to let the devil defeat you uh, because your loved one died and the funeral happened to be in the Berean Baptist Church and yet you have to go to an empty home where you spent 24 hours a day or at least you spent night time with that loved one and there's remembrances all around where you're living. There's pictures on the wall, the way the furniture is situated in the house, the clothes in the closet. Uh, the shoes in the closet of the furniture was there just exactly like you all put it and you sat in it and you lived in it. I said, you mean you can go back into that environment to, and it doesn't bother you, but it bothers you because you had the funeral at the Berean Baptist Church? I said, let me tell you something. The devil is using that incident to get you sidetracked and to get you out of church. When my wife was lying over at the funeral home in a casket before we had the funeral, I came to this pulpit and preached Sunday morning and Sunday night. And I never missed a service. Because if there's any time a man or a woman ought to get close to God, it is when their loved ones have gone to heaven because there comes a time when the words of humanity will not reach the hurt that one experiences. Uh, and a handshake or a hug uh, is wonderful so far as it goes, but it won't reach the depths of the hurt. There's only one that can get down there and bring that comfort and consolation, and that's the Holy Spirit of God. And my friend, if there's ever a time we need the church body and we need each other, it's when death comes into our homes and we have to say goodbye to those that we love so dearly uh, and we need to get away from this fact well you know I remember used to sitting here and used to say well sit in another place in the church it's foolish it's the way the devil operates to get people out of church. It's the way the devil operates uh, to get people thinking about things uh, uh, and, and don't bring them to reality to see the full-fledged picture as it really is. Boy, the devil works, works on us. You say, well, he don't work on me. Well, we'll have an invitation in a few minutes for people that tell stories. He sure does. I looked out across the congregation one Sunday morning where I was pastoring years ago. I noticed there wasn't a single young person in the church. I asked somebody after the service, I said, where's all the young people? Well, their scoutmaster took them over in the mountains this morning. I said, you've got to be kidding. I said, yeah, all the young people this morning, uh, uh, they went with their scoutmaster over and uh, that kind of, it didn't sit right with me and I called him on Monday. I said, I understand you took the, all the young people from about two or three churches here in the city over in the mountains on Sunday. Oh, yeah, we had a wonderful time. I said, don't you understand that those young people would be better off in church because the Bible commands that they be in church than sitting over yonder on the mountainside somewhere on Sunday? I'm not against going to the mountains on Sunday. I, I'm not, if you take vacation or something, but just to take them out to have a big time, that's a different story. I'll never forget what he said. Well, those young people, they were probably just as well off over there uh, looking at the God of nature. I said, well, let me tell you something, my fine feathered friend. The God of nature didn't die to save them. And I said, let me ask you something else. Uh, since you've got the God on the mountainside, uh, let me ask you, how many missionaries are you supporting over there on the mountainside? How many people got saved over there in your mountainside church this past Sunday? Yeah. Oh, he didn't like me, of course. <laughs> but that was all right. Fact is fact. Well, let me tell you, the devil will use anything he can to get you out, to keep you out, and to get you away from doing what's right. Yeah. That's the reason the Bible said, love not this world. Because this world is after you. This world wants to destroy you. Now, loving the world 
denies our faith in God. I want you to notice, if you will, in verse number 16. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. There are three illustrations that he gives us here. Hear me well. There are three illustrations that he gives us here <clears throat> that everybody has to face. These three illustrations are the illustrations that the devil uses in the, life of, the lives of Christians to draw them to the world away from the perfect will of God. Let's look at them for just a moment. Loving the world denies our faith in God. First of all, notice what he says, the lust of the flesh. Now this is, this is the way the devil defeats those of us that get too close to this world system. The lust of the flesh. Now watch it. This is the inward temptation. The inward temptation. This happens to be des the desires. Now, the right kind of desires are okay. But the devil wants to put the wrong kind of inward desires there to get you to lust after the wrong things, to draw you towards this world. Now, there's, for instance, there's nothing wrong uh, with having a roof over your head. In fact, uh, I recommend it. Uh, God has put within us self-preservation. I'm grateful for the roof I have over my head. I know you're grateful for the house you live in. And it's wonderful when we can have a, a comfortable home in which to live. But let me, have, let me show you how the devil will take that which is needful and cause us to have inward desires to put the roof over our head that will affect us spiritually. How many times through the years have I had people to say to me, you know, I bought this because I really thought I wanted it, but I can't afford it. And I don't know what I'm going to do because I'm having to work night and day to make the payments uh, to, to, to pay for it. There's nothing wrong with living in a nice house. There's nothing wrong with having some carpet on your floor or hardwoods or, or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not putting that down. I recommend you live in a house. It sure is better than living in a tent. Nothing wrong with that. But let me tell you where the problem comes. When you look out your window one day and your neighbor's building onto a room and putting a basement under the new addition. And you look at your wife and you say, you know, our neighbor's uh, building on over there. Might be advantageous if we build a room or two on. Now, in many instances, it's not that they need the room or two. It's just they want to stay ahead. Uh, we've got people in our church named Joneses. I'm not picking on them tonight. But there's an old, old saying, uh, people trying to stay ahead of the Joneses. The Joneses about fell over from nervous exhaustion trying to stay ahead. When people want to go to such extravagance that they put themselves in financial bondage, to where they can't enjoy living because they're having to work all of the time. My friend, they've gone beyond the normal. They've allowed that inward lust and desire to have more, put handcuffs on them to where they can't go to church and they can't enjoy being saved because they're having to continually work themselves to death just to make their payments. My friend, that's where the devil captivates a bunch of people. Uh, so, you know, uh, somebody be driving the car and Maybe don't have that many miles on it, but uh, it gets to rattling somewhere. And, and the husband be going down the road and he'll say, well, I, I hear that rattle. Maybe we'll just go ahead and trade this car. Now, you got the car paid off. It might be easier to pay four or $500 repair bill than a $300 car payment for the next 48 months. But the devil will convince us. Listen, he will use these simple things to handcuff us. To get us in the position of where we can't do the spiritual things we want to. Because we've had lust for, to get ahead. The inward desire in this world to get ahead. And to supposedly have a more comfortable home or more comfortable automobile. Because we like the smell of new leather. That's alright up to a point. But if, it, if the devil's going to use that to handicap us. To cool us off spiritually. My friend, that is the tool of the devil trying to encourage 
encapsulate us to get us out of the will of God. It's always good before you make a major decision like that is not to do it on the spur of the moment, but saturate that decision in prayer. <laughs> Lord, should I get rid of this Ford? Lord, should I get rid of this Chevrolet? And all the Ford men said, Lord, should I get rid of this Chevrolet? And all the Ford men said, I don't want any of these Ford men bragging on Fords any longer. They had their chance and they dropped the ball. But we need to pray about these decisions. Man, there's people that are handicapped tonight. They can't, they can't serve the Lord like they ought to serve the Lord because the lust of the flesh has come after them and encaptured them to the extent they are completely tied to this world system and they can't do anything spiritually because they're trying to keep their head above the water. That's a tool of the devil to make you worldly. Amen, Amen preacher Beatty. That's good preaching. Thank you. There's the lust of the flesh. Secondly, there's the lust of the eyes. That's the temptation that comes from outside of the body. The lust of the flesh is an inward desire. That is uh, something that we're to be captivated by the show of things. Uh, it's people using money they don't have to impress people they don't like. Let me move on. But do you remember when Lot got in trouble? The lust of the eyes. You know what separated Lot and Abraham? The Bible said in the book of Genesis that Lot looked out over the well-watered plains of the Jordan. What caused him to move towards Sodom? The lust of the eyes. He said, man, that's a good place to raise cattle down there in that Jordan. He didn't know when he moved in Jordan, the next move would be in Sodom and Gomorrah. The lust of the eyes eventually. Now, he had no desire to get to Sodom and Gomorrah, but the devil tricked him. When he got down there in the valley, he was next door to Sodom and Gomorrah. And the devil knew if he can move him to that position, he can move him to the next position. And it cost him his family. As a matter of fact, some of the enemies of Israel came out of that experience. <laughs> God had to send the angels down there to push him out of Sodom and said the fire is going to fall. And when they got outside the city, Mrs. Lot looked back because her heart was still in Sodom and Gomorrah. Right, and she turned into a pillar of salt. The lust of the eyes. Look at the last one here in this passage of Scripture. Notice what it says. The pride of life. That's a desire to have an importance that other people will notice. The pride of life. It's a pride that drives a person's ego. It's uh, to impress people with our so-called importance. Man, look me over. It's to do something to cause envy in other people's lives as they, as they look at us. <laughs> the pride of life. These three things are the strategy of Satan for every Christian. I'll say it again. These three things are the strategy of Satan for every Christian. All three of those truths in 1 John chapter 2 was evident in the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden. The devil's tricks haven't changed. Back there in the Garden... That tree, the Bible said, looked good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes. The devil said, if you partake of this, it will make you wise. That's the pride of life. It was all there in the Garden of Eden. We fast forward to the New Testament. We see Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew 4 out in the wilderness temptation. The devil tried the same three sins on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread, lust of the flesh. If you're the son of God, cast yourself down from this pinnacle. Your angels will come and catch you. Uh, Put on some kind of a big show, lust of the eyes. Uh, He showed Jesus the kingdoms of the world. And he said, if you'll bow down and you will serve me, all of these kingdoms I'll give to you, the pride of life. Listen, the devil hasn't changed. He wants to use these three avenues right now, tonight, this week, this year, in your life and in my life to get us so close to the world that we lose our effectiveness for the cause of Jesus Christ. The world destroys our future. Look at verse 17. The world passes away. If you're tagged to this world, you're going to lose because the world is going to go down. The world passes away. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Luther said this, I've held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But the things I placed in God's hands, I still possess. You've heard the story many times of Jim Elliott, a great missionary to the Indians who lost his life trying to carry the gospel to them. And when they finally found him and found some of his personal belongings after they had killed him, they found these words, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. There's no future in this world It's going to pass away. Everything in this world has the shelf life of the last automobile you bought. And how many times have you purchased an automobile and have I purchased purchased an automobile and we said, man, this, this, this is really nice. We're going to have this for a while and a few years come by and you say that about the next car you purchase. Because everything down here is decaying and passing away. You say, well, preacher, how can I have victory over all these things? I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to show you three things right here in closing in the book of 1 John that will help us tonight to understand we don't have to love this world system. There's three things that we can do to give us victory over this world system. Number one, turn in your Bibles to 1 John if you're not there. But I want you to notice with me 1 John chapter 5. Flip over there right quick. First John chapter 5, verse number 4. You are God, little children, and you've overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'll tell you something, my friend. It's vitally important that you understand tonight that you can overcome the world by being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I preached a series of messages on that not long ago. We overcome the world. First John, excuse me, I'm reading in chapter 4. I told told you fifth chapter and I turned to chapter 4. First John chapter 5. 4 and 5. Notice this. First John chapter 5, verse number 4. For whatsoever, that's my second point I just gave you. I'll get back to it in just a minute. I wonder what's in this water up here. Jackie, you've been messing with my water. Hmm? Holy Spirit in it. Excuse me? I put Holy Spirit in it. Made you, of holy water. Holy water. You put spirits in it? Yeah. First John chapter 5, let's move on. Verse number 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth. That Jesus is the Son of God. Number one, the way we overcome the world is to make sure we're saved and don't let the devil cause you to doubt your salvation. This, these two verses of Scripture here says, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. When the devil comes along and tries to tempt you, to get you to doubt your faith, 
If you've got it nailed down that I'm saved and sure for glory and there's nothing in this world that can stop me, there's nothing in this world that can prevent me from going to glory, I know I'm saved and you get to the place where the devil can't even cause you to doubt your salvation, there's no need of the devil coming to you and trying to get you to conform to this world because you say to him when he shows up, this world is not my home, I'm just a traveling through. You get it nailed down, you're saved. Let me tell you who the devil comes along and tries to impress more than anybody else. The people that's always walking around and say, well, I hope so. You know you're saved. Get in the book. Look at 1 John chapter 5. Look at the book. 1 John chapter 5 verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know. Amen. You can know you're saved. That's what the Bible said. Don't you let the devil put doubt in you. You don't have to succumb to this world. If you know you're saved, you recognize you're not driving your tent pegs down very deep down here anyway because you're going to a different world. You're going to the heavenly Jerusalem. You're on your way there and the devil can't do anything to sidetrack you or turn you because your affection is on things above, not on things of this world because you've got it nailed down. You're saved and all of the devils of hell can't cause you to doubt, to doubt it one iota. That's the way you overcome this world is to know that you know that you know that you're saved. The second way you can know you're saved is 1 John chapter 4. And before I got Jackie's holy water, I, I was on this a while ago. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 4. You are of God, little children, and overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. How do you go overcome the world? Well, number one, know you're saved. Number two, realize the Spirit of God is living within you. And if we'll, uh, if we'll desire the fullness uh, and the feeling of the Holy Spirit of God, and we'll walk around in the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God, this world will have no attraction on us. Amen. Amen. We can't win in the flesh, but I got some good news for you tonight. We can win in the spirit. Right. Lastly, Jackie, don't say amen. First John chapter two, verse number 14. Here's how we overcome the world. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him. That's from the beginning. I have written unto young men because you're strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. In all three of those verses of scripture, there was the word overcome found. We overcome because we know we're saved. We overcome because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And we overcome when the Word of God is precious to us and important to us. And we feed on the Word of God. We can overcome this world. Amen. We overcome through the power of the Word. Well, I am so glad that years ago I got a hold of the truth that I don't have to live according to the dictates of this world. And I want you to hear me. We're going to have an invitation. The most miserable person in the world is, I don't think is the lost Christian. Uh, excuse me, the lost individual. I think the, mo the most difficult person in the world is the Christian that's out of fellowship with God. I want to back up and rephrase, uh, uh, I'll visit what I just said, the lost Christian. A Christian is someone who outwardly mimics Christ. There's a lot of people in this world who call themselves Christians, but they're lost. Just because we take titles don't mean we're saved. A person can have a lot of the attributes of Christ and still be lost. I've met a lot of those clean living lost people down through the years of my ministry. Never been saved. But I'll tell you, when you're saved and the Holy Spirit of God lives within you, and you grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. When you grieve the Holy Spirit of God living within you, that's the reason you fuss all the time with your husband or your wife. And you blamed it on him or blamed it on her. And it got so quiet when I said that. 
A person out of fellowship with God looks in the mirror of a morning and says, you're mean. And you're right when you say that. Because we are. There's nothing good within us. But let me tell you, when we get controlled and motivated by the love of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and we know we're saved, there's not enough devils in this world to get us to conform to the secular standard of this world because we know we're living on a higher plane and we're not going to step down to the lower standard that this old lost world is trying to get us enticed in. Let me tell you, going down the road uh, of the lost person, uh, it, it has a lot of beautiful grass uh, along the side of the road and a lot of beautiful billboards, uh, but the end thereof is the way of death and destruction. Uh, the Bible said that he that liveth or she that liveth in sin, uh, is, is there's pleasures in sin for a season, but he or she that live in sin, the Bible says uh, they're heading for destruction. It's only for a season. It will soon be over. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Let me tell you something. If you've been saved, and walking in fellowship with the Lord, you know what I'm about to say is as truth, uh, has as much truth in it as the fact you're sitting in a chair tonight. The happiest you've ever been in your life is when you're saved and walking in fellowship with the Lord and enjoying being saved. The meanest you've ever been in your life is when you get out of fellowship with the Lord. And you can't stand yourself and you can't stand anybody around you and nobody around you can stand you. Now, I didn't expect anybody to jump up and shout. But you know I'm telling you the truth. You get out of fellowship with God, you're the most miserable person in your household. When you come in the house, if you leave the door open, the dog will tuck his tail between his legs and bark a few times and get out in the yard and go out the door himself. He don't want to be around a backslidden Christian. I mean, you get up of a morning, go out to get the paper, stumble over the dog, kick, kick the bottom of the screen door out, and, and stumble down the sidewalk and fall across the yard and trip over this and trip over that, and you come back in. Let's roll off, you say it this way. The average person gets up in the morning, turns the news of the world on, and looks at all the problems of the world. They fill their system with caffeinated coffee. They pick up the newspaper, and they look at the problems of the world. They never pray. They never pick up the Bible to see what the good news is. And when they get their body, body caffeinated, uh, and they look at all the problems of the world, and then they go out uh, at this whole mad world, uh, and uh, they're disgusted and discouraged, uh, and they go out in this world, uh, and they don't have a good day because they started the day off wrong. Look, the best way to start your day off is in the Word of God. The best way to start your day off is take time to pray. The best, day you, best way you can start your day off uh, is to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, fill me today for service. Amen, Ski. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. My word to us tonight from the book of 1 John is don't live too close to the world. If you should be moving in that direction tonight, you need to move to the altar and say, God, help me to turn away from the road I'm on. Help me to move back towards the cross. Lord, don't let me be conformed to this world. Don't let me be a friend of this world. Lord, let me be different than this world. We're going to have an invitation here in just a moment, but I wonder if you're in the building tonight, you'd say by an upraised hand, please pray for me. I don't want to become conformed to this world. I don't want the world to influence me to do what's wrong. By the grace of God, I want to live for Jesus. By the grace of God, I want to experience a daily fullness of the Spirit of God. I want to allow the Word of God to be a part of my life. I don't want to succumb uh, to uh, this old world system. I don't want to sap my spiritual vigor, my spiritual life. Please pray for me. Are there others tonight? Heavenly Father, I pray for all of these hands tonight that's lifted. I realize we have a mutual enemy. You've taught us tonight what the enemy consists of. It's this old world we're living in. Lord, help us to not live in the shadow of this world system. 
Help us to live in the shadow of the new Jerusalem. Help us, Lord, to lift our eyes towards the country to which we're going. And help us to derive our joy and our blessings and our benefit from that city to which we're headed. And help us tonight, if we're drifting and moving in the wrong direction, to come around this old-fashioned altar tonight and get it turned around. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Others need to come. Would you come as we sing this stanza? Just stand.